God. Ethan, he's an emerging artist uh, among this year's inaugural. I don't know if you know this, Southwest School had its first graduating class this year, and Ethan was one of them. Born and raised in San Antonio, he has an art focus on ceramics with additional interest in painting and drawing. He also loves to cook, often making too much to, to eat on his own, as you can tell. His work has been featured in groups, shows at Cinnabon, Rubio South, and the recent Common Currents exhibit at the Carver Community Cultural Center. After graduation, Ethan plans to stay local and acquire more teaching experience while developing his, his commercial art uh, ceramic wares. He's somebody to watch. He's, you're 21 years old. My big achievement when I was his age was learning how to carve a bong out of an apple. So, anyway, Ethan, give it up. Ethan Gonzalez. Okay. Um, so before I begin, I would like to thank uh, all of the Pecha Kucha organizers. They made this whole process very painless for me. Um, and I'd also like to thank Paula Owen, president of the Southwest School of Art. And all the faculty and staff, in particular, my ceramics professors, Jennifer Ling Dachuk um, and Ryan Takaba, who are currently on like a well-deserved vacation in Japan right now. Um, and then also everyone else in the extended Southwest School of Art community, and of course, my family. So my thesis body of work began as an investigation of the material known to ceramists as terra sigillata. This substance is perhaps most familiar to us as the black lustrous coating on the uh, surface of the iconic black figure and red figure vessels produced by the ancient Greeks. The Latin name terra sigillata refers to a Roman style of pottery, but conventionally speaking, the name applies to any refined clay-based surface finish. Though similar techniques were developed independently in the Americas by the Maya and Molche cultures, for example, most of the available research on terra sigillata concerns Greek wares, so that's where I focused my own efforts. Between the 1920s and 1960s, a great deal of research was conducted by archaeologists, chemists, and historians to better understand the precise nature of the coating. The first breakthrough determined that both the vessel and coating were made from the same clay body, while the second concerned reverse engineering the firing process that made it possible to have the same um, material appear in two distinct states on the same vessel. The most comprehensive work on the subject was published by Joseph Noble in 1960. Now this is the book you want if your aim is to replicate a Greek vase. Um, however, my own aim instead became to craft an object that allowed the materiality of terra sigillata itself to come into view. Now terra sigillata is simply prepared by mixing clay and water along with something else to keep uh, the clay particles in suspension such as soda ash. After a period of two to three weeks, the heavier particles will settle to the bottom of the jar, leaving the finest ones floating in the topmost layer. The topmost layer is then siphoned off and reduced to the re um, desired consistency. A jar this size will yield about two cups of the very precious substance. Um, the substance was then applied to clay disc forms that were cut from a larger slab of clay, but not before burnishing them with a smooth stone to consolidate and compress the surface. This laborious process realigns the surface particles of the disc in a manner that increases the amount of light it can reflect. This step is crucial for obtaining the, character, the sheen characteristic of Greek wares. And as you can see, even in the unfired state, uh, the coating shines brighter than a new penny. And although my early tests went well with regards to finding the right temperature range to fire the work, it was making a substance that was naturally red transform into black that became the biggest hurdle. When iron-rich terra sig is fired in a neutral atmosphere, the resulting product is that familiar red-orange color characteristic of terracotta. But when that same material is fired uh, in a reducing atmosphere, that is, one containing an abundance of carbon monoxide, um, the red iron oxide present in the material transforms into black iron oxide and black magnetic iron oxide. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of what that looks like. The red test piece was fired in an electric kiln, while the black one was fired in a gas kiln under reducing conditions. The black piece you see there was actually my very first attempt at attaining this finish, and literally months went by before I was able to attain that same result. Well, uh, you see though, uh, <laughs> though the kiln gives, the kiln also takes. Um, for example, the test pieces on the bottom of that kiln shelf barely reduced at all, while the piece on the shelf just inches above is a very unsatisfactory brown. Um, the disc in the back over there uh, exploded due to a hidden pocket of air, um, but eventually, after some trial and error, I was able to dial it in. 
This is what an ideal firing looks like. And to say that I meant to do that would be quite dishonest of me. Uh, this kind of result is more accurately described as a collaboration between clay, bricks, airflow, and fire, along with myself, each operating as an actor, each having a say in the ultimate outcome of each firing. So when you look at the forms that were lucky enough to survive um, and finally get them up on that dang wall, you can now consider how what you're looking at is clay that is transformed out of itself into itself, revealing a new aspect of brilliance that was actually present the whole time. My hope was that through this complex gesture of refining, purifying, and ordering a substance as ubiquitous as clay, I could enhance its aesthetic power and make it more available to our senses. Um, and moreover, my philosophical stance um, is that what I say about this matter in particular applies to the rest of the material world. I believe that it's critical that artists and non-artists alike recognize that there is something inherently lively about matter itself that precedes our uses of it that it has powers and propensities, propensities of its own that often elude human will. There's also a very common assumption that creativity is a uniquely human capacity and that the materials we work with are merely passive vehicles of expression. Any skilled artist knows that the creative agency is always distributed across an assemblage of many things, be it materials, tools, equipment, or anything else that contributes and thereby sustains uh, the creative process. To place humanity at the apex of the hierarchy of being is to disregard the creative capacity of non-human things, which in effect is to shut down our own awareness of our own being, since we are, after all, just complex orderings of matter. Um, in other words, to raise the material status of things and of stuff is to raise the status of the ma vital materiality that all things share. And this, I feel, is what characterizes an ecological sensibility. Put into practice, the sensibility takes many forms, but for me, as an artist, it means cultivating one's aesthetic openness to the creative powers that circulate throughout um, the plane of existence. It means refusing the distinction that that which is vital is active and living, and that that which is material is fundamentally inert and inanimate. It means that artworks are just as much subjects as they are objects. It means that intentionality cannot be uh, totally ascribed to the artist in a given situation. It means that as we give shape and give form to the things that we make and subsequently circulate in the world, they likewise give shape and give form to our minds, our bodies, and our lives. So the next time you find yourself wandering about in the material world, and you find yourself stricken, either by something beautiful, estranging, or perhaps by something possessing a quality that cannot yet be named, move beyond the social context of the thing or its symbolic meaning. Think outside of its practical nature. Dig deeper than its place in the strata of human history. Experiment, theorize, and reflect. Ask yourself some questions. What's up with this stuff? What can it do? What's its potential? What is it doing? What can it become? And more importantly, what does it want from me? Thank you. What a great job. Great job. Great job, Issa. I am so impressed with this younger generation, and they're, they're so more advanced than I was. I'm old. He's new. I'm reading from paper. He read from his phone. Um, so uh, we're going to oh, – it's not off? Not on? Okay. Well, let's, let's do this. Um, what would your, what would your five-year plan be? Do you have a – Okay, do you cool. Have a, do, you have a, like, do you have a perfect job for yourself in the future? Um, no. Would you like? Would you like to I've, teach? I've kind of a teach a self-sustaining. I've kind of uh, accepted that I'm going to have a variety of odd jobs, a lot of Magna a, a lot. It's it's something that sustains. You have to find something that sustains your creative practice, but you also have to acknowledge that the the creative process doesn't fit the nine to five format. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It doesn't fit the seasonal, you know, financial schedule like at all. It's That's right. it's. It's a different kind of rhythm. Well, if I, if I can make a suggestion as somebody who took that path, <laughs> find a job that doesn't suck the creative All Right, that's the main, that's the main know, goal. Find a, find a good job. And anyway, yeah. I see big things for you. Anyway, give it up for Ethan Gonzalez. Thank you.